and how easy this attack of shaitan can infiltrate and destroy the iman of a believer. You see, the shaitan is not concerned that the guy that's dancing away at the club or drinking away at the bar or taking some shots of drugs, that he's going to end up doing something shameless. He's not worried about them because they're already on track. He is worried about the loose ends, the sales that he hasn't made yet. Those are the believers. That's who he's concerned with. So the more a believer tries to purify himself, the more he or she will find that the opportunities to engage in shamelessness are throwing themselves at him. Throwing themselves at him. Women out of nowhere will come up to you and say, Hi, how are you? Out of nowhere. And you know you have a beard and you're trying to look unattractive. You know, trying to save yourself in society. But you know shaitan will come to these women and say, Hey, by the way, I've got one of my key prospects here, why don't you go say hello or smile at them? You know, when you, when you serve them at the counter, just give them an extra smile. Right? Or make small talk or something. They will try to mess with you. The shayateen will try to mess with you by means of other things. Right? And you know, this is something you have to be extra, extra careful of. Because the easiest thing for you to lose is your sensitivity to shamelessness. In a society where shamelessness is as common as the air we breathe. It's just part of the culture. Women barely dressed at the grocery store, just get used to it, you know. The first day you come from Saudi or Pakistan or some religious village in Egypt, and you come here, the first few months you're like, Astaghfirullah, 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 Astaghfirullah. And you get to know the pavement really well, because you don't look anywhere else, right? You know every crack that comes your way. But after a while, you kind of, you know, it's life, what are you going to do, you know? I came, you know, I, my early schooling was in Saudi. All boys school, all male teachers, and you know. And my, I come here and my parents, may Allah reward them, they put me in high school, right? Public high school in Queens. So I go into Queens, and I walk into the classroom, and there's men, and these girls are barely dressed, and I'm completely embarrassed. I mean, I'm, my face is right, I don't know what to do. Maybe I'm in the wrong place or something, right? And those first few months were insane for me. I wouldn't even touch the railings to go up the stairs because Najas people have touched them. You know, these people are, you know, in the one mushrikeen and Najas. So, you know, but you know what happens over time? Oh, what's the big deal? Let's just, you know, that's just life. What are you going to do? How long are you going to fight it? So you have this culture shock and eventually you get over it and it becomes part of the norm. That's exactly what we don't want. That's not what we want. Because as soon as, the dis as soon as the believer becomes, you know, desensitized to evil, to fahsha, then his iman is in trouble. And her iman is in trouble. You know, our, nowadays an example of that, uh, you know, kids will say, we're going to go see this movie. It's only PG-13. Or it only has one bad scene. And we're renting a movie, it's got a bad scene, yeah, but we're going to forward the part. <laughs> right? No, really. And, and, and you, the parents say, oh yeah, just PG-13, yeah. Some sexual content, that's not a lot of sexual content, it's just some sexual content. I'm, I'm saying this explicitly because this is the reality. Our kids are going to watch these things. And the parents are endorsing them. They're okay with it. Now the new thing that's come out is, you know, Wallahi, I heard this in, uh, at our own Sunday school, and this is not the exception, this is the norm. You know, kids around the country, they don't talk to the Muslim you know, leaders, their teachers, their peers, they talk to each other. So you have to spy on them a little bit. So I had this habit of spying on kids, you know. And so I'd be around the back and the kids were talking, my mom let me buy a game that's NC-17. Man, it's awesome, you guys, he's cursing and everything. And they're real, they're real proud of it too, right? And they got it for Eid, subhanAllah. <laughs> they're celebrating the, you know, the obedience to Allah with <laughs> fahsha and disobedience. So we have to, you know, this is serious, serious stuff. Once you are desensitized to what you see on the screen, then you have, the, the only logical next step is, you will not lower your eyes when you're walking down the street. And the logical next step is, you're going to try to do what the people on the screen do. Right? And it's just one step after another. And it's just a downward spiral. So how do you counter this culture? How do you fight this thing? You fight this thing first of all by taking probably the most difficult step you will in your, in your adult life is to cut TV off. It's a very difficult step. It's the, I, I, can, I can tell you if you're used to it, it's not easy, right? But we as Muslim families, for the sake of our children and our own dignity as Muslims, we have to do it. We have to cut TV out. If you want the news, go to, go to the dot-coms, right? And avoid the banner ads even there. 
But you know, there's ways of getting the news. There is still the radio, alhamdulillah, it's still in place, and it still tells you the news, right? You can get in the the excuses that I used to get a few years ago before you know the the media on the web spread like the, like the way it did. It used to be, well, how are we going to get the news? If you know the you know we we need to listen to CNN and Fox. I was like, you don't need to listen to CNN and Fox. But even if that's your excuse, that excuse is dead now because better media outlets for the news and information are available online. Probably you get more reliable information online than you do on television, right? So, you know, get rid of those excuses and clean up your house. Don't get your children a portable video iPod. Don't get them a video iPod because you don't know what they can put on there. They can put stuff on there and hide it in folders you don't even know exist. They're very smart. They can name it directory like, you know, uh, root or system or, you know, they'll name it something creative. Ah, this is just, you know, information files. And it's in there. You have to understand, our kids are very, very smart. They're sharp. And they're on top of technology, the latest means. So you have to, you know, watch out for this. There's new statistics out about these video players that, you know, that children are bringing to schools and get, they're getting confiscated and they're being looked at and most of them have pornography in them with children, elementary school. So this is serious business. This is not a joke, and this is not the children of the kuffar alone. Don't think like that. Don't think that your oh, I come from a Muslim family, our kids don't do those things. Please, let's everybody wake up, okay? If the children of Yaqub alayhi salam can get to the point of being willing to kill their brother, who are children of a prophet, and grandchildren of a prophet, and great-grandchildren of a prophet, they are sons of Yaqub, grandsons of who? Ishaq alayhi salam. Great grandsons of who? Ibrahim alayhi salam. If they can't argue, Yaqub alayhi salam is not saying they come from a good family, they wouldn't do anything bad. Because he doesn't have that argument. Righteousness is not inherited in bloodlines. And if, they're, if they can do something bad, none of our families are pure enough. Because they're three generations of prophets. Right? You can't say, oh, we're from this family or that family, or our last name is this, and we brought the pure bloodlines here, so our children are, are free of these temptations. They have these temptations. And we have to make sure that they fight them. And this is also, if it's not a concern for yourself, it will not trickle down to your children. You have to have that concern yourself. A lot of times I've seen the hypocrisy, the nifaq, inside the household. Parents are watching something, the kids come out and say, hey, leave the room, this is not for you. This is not for little kids, it's for us to watch this stuff. You know? And the kids, they, they talk, you befriend them, they talk, yeah, my mom watches, and my dad watches these movies, you know, there's a lot of singing and dancing in it. But I just hear about it because they don't let me watch it. You know? But I know all the songs by heart, because you know, I've heard them so many times. And this is the hypocrisy inside the house of the Muslim. It's insane. So we have to understand, this is serious stuff. And it will have very, very negative consequences later on. It's, it's bad enough for our deen, but it will ruin your dunya. And let me tell you some horror stories. I'm not going to name anybody specific, or tell you any specific story. But it's happened to me more than a dozen times. That parents have come up to me when I've given a talk like this and said, Can you talk to my teenage son? Can you talk to my daughter? She's got some problems. She's not listening to me anymore. And I think they've got, she's got some boy problems or some girl problems, right? And you know why that happened? Because now that they're teenagers and they're independent, it's too late, the ship has already sailed. When they were under your midst, you didn't care. You were putting the extra hours in at work, so you can put the down payment in for the house. And the wife was also doing some work somewhere else, so the, baby, the cable TV was babysitting the child. And now that they have the power to act out what they've been watching all along, their shaykh on TV has been doing that all along, and now they're acting it out, now you're surprised. Don't be surprised. They're just doing taqlid of what they've, you know, the dars they've been getting every day. That's what it is. It's not, it's not a surprise. How could they do this to me? How could you do this to them? <laughs> they didn't do this to you, you did this to them. You programmed, programmed them this way. Just because we have Muslim names, if we are part of the same exact culture that everybody else is a part of, the outcome is going to be the same. Right? We have to change the environment within the homes and how our children are taking in media. So this is a you know, very important thing, inshallah ta'ala, for all of us. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ Again, I want to leave this with a, a few pieces of practical advice. Please do not put a computer in your child's room. If you want to put a computer, put it in the kitchen, put it in the living room. Don't face it against the wall, face it against the outside, so anybody who walks in can see what's going on in the screen. Right? 
do not make sure, make sure you check the histories and make, have software that can recover the internet histories on your browsers so you can find out if your child has a Facebook account or a MySpace account and what their, you know, uh, username is because they will have other usernames and you don't even know your children are living double lives and they are believe me there's a lot going on out there you know and you'll find it and you'll be shocked how can this be but you have to you have to get involved in your children's life and the final piece of advice don't freak out because we come from a culture when our children disappoint us in the least bit then we say, how could you do this to me, your disappointment? You know, we come from a culture where the child gets an 88 on the exam, and he's so proud of himself, and he comes to the father and says, Dad, I got an 88. Okay, next time get a 90. And you get a 90, why didn't you get a 100? What's the matter with you? Right? There's always you could have done more. There's no appreciation of our children. Right? And so when something like this, you find out your boy was, you know, your, your, your son comes to you one day and says, you know, Dad, this girl asked me to go to the prom. And he just comes to you not knowing what your reaction is going to be. Poor kid, well, he, he asked the wrong question. Then you, he will ask, well, what is prom, bete? And then you, <laughs> then you tell him, then the child tells him the, what the prom is, and my goodness, you know, it's like his, you know, the extra hair fell off the head, and he's screaming, we brought you to America for this, and you give him a beating, and you yell at him, and you tell the mother, and you know, all kinds of craziness inside the house. This child will swear to himself that if next time there is a girl talking to him or anything like that, the last person he will ever tell is who? You. The mother, the sister, the brother, he will not tell you. Who will he tell? His non-Muslims friends that will say, yeah, that's awesome, man, go for it. That's who he's going to tell. So you have to learn to take it and be able to deal with it. You cannot deal with it if you freak out. Because that would have worked in Pakistan, maybe. It would have worked in Bangladesh, it would have worked somewhere else, it's not going to work here. It is not going to work here. Your children will simply shut you out. There will be someone outside and someone else when they walk inside those doors. There will just be someone else. I can tell you this from personal experience. Wallahi, I've seen this many, many times. Children are totally different. Totally different people. Like you wouldn't recognize them when they are at school, when they are on campus, as opposed to when they are at home. Completely unrecognizable. And the parents would have no idea. They're completely oblivious because all they care about is the report card. The report card's good, everything else is good. Let me get you this, let me get you, let me get you a cell phone of your own, and I'm not going to check your phone history, nor will I receive your bill and go through all the phone numbers. Who's been calling you? I don't need to do that because, you know, it's a good boy good grades. You know, boys with good grades and girls with good grades in this society, Muslim society, have drinking problems, have drug problems, have boyfriend, girlfriend problems, and that's the reality. So let's wake up to it, right? We have to face these things. When ladina hum li furujihim hafidun has to become a movement within the Muslim community. We have to gather our youth together and talk about these things and help them cope with these things. Because what we're asking to, them to do, these things, this is crazy. Did you know? And I, don't be shocked by this. You go to high school and many of the high schools, and if you if you haven't you know committed zina, then you're an object of ridicule. And this guy hasn't even done anything yet. You know, he's still just a kid. They're being made fun of because they haven't committed zina. Imagine that. And that's the culture in which they are. So what we are asking them to do is making them the object of ridicule among their peers. This is a very difficult thing for them to be asked to do. And if we don't have any, any measures of supporting them, of having them talk to someone, of letting these feelings out, these frustrations out, giving them alternative venues, then we have monumentally failed. You know, the, the, the signs of our failure are when we are having talks and our children are not here. Our youth are not here. Because they have no interest in being here. And that's our fault, not their fault. We have to make the masajid interesting for our youth. Otherwise, it starts with lahu and it ends with fahsha. It starts with lahu. It starts with wasting their time and eventually when you waste your time, you find the worst things to do with your time. And that is what this society is calling you towards. So this is very, very serious.